Welcome everyone to our last session today and to our keynote um, speech that will be done by Professor Floria Antias and let me introduce her first. Professor Floria Antias is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Roehampton and a visiting professor at City University and the University of East London. Her main academic writings have explored the intersections of social divisions and identities, different forms of stratification, and how inequalities and belonging connect, interconnect. She has developed the concept of translocational positionality as a way of addressing some of the difficulties identified with concepts of identity and intersectionality. She is published in top peer-reviewed journals. Flora's books include, get ready, Women, Nation, State, Palgrave, which I've been teaching for many years, Racialized Boundaries, Nation, Race, Ethnicity, Color, and Class, and the Anti-Racist Struggle, Trotletch, Ethnicity, Class, Gender, and Migration, Greek Cypriots, Cypriots in Britain, Ashgate, Gender and Migration in Southern Europe, Berg, Into the Margins, Migration and Exclusion in Southern Europe, Ashgate again, Rethinking Anti-Racism, Rutledge, Paradoxes of Integration, Female Migrant in Europe, Springer, Contesting Integration in Gendering Migration, Palgrave, and Work and the Challenge of Belonging, Cambridge Scholars Publishing. Thank you, Floria, for joining us. We really appreciate you coming here, and please. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd also like to thank um, Orna and the other organisers of this conference for inviting me and to say that I was particularly attracted to come here because of the kind of work that um, Orna, Orly and, other, and others are doing, you know, in the department. And that was very important for me. So I want to start by saying that I've been working on some of these issues of social difference, of social inequality, as you heard, of social stratification for many years. And one of the things that I've, I've come to is that it's actually very difficult in concrete social relations to make absolute distinctions between particular forms of social divisions because in real life they are very much enmeshed in each other and in the practices of social actors. So I'm going to start by just telling you something about my presentation. Um, and as you can see there, I'm going to be going through a number of different aspects related to the work that you've been doing here in this conference. And the few papers that I heard this afternoon were absolutely fascinating. And I've learned a lot, actually, about the Ashkenazis and Mizrahis and concepts of honor and dignity and so on, which um, fit in very well with my own work but actually show very much the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. So first of all, I want to start with a more broad issue that concerns us all, which is about thinking about the boundaries of belonging and hierarchy. Because all the social divisions that we've been talking about today, of ethnicity, of class, much less of gender, but equally important, relate to boundaries of belonging, but also be relate to boundaries and hierarchy. And one of the main positions that I've taken in my own work is that issues of belonging, of boundaries of belonging, cannot be separated from issues of hierarchy because spaces of belonging and unbelonging are modes by which access to resources, entitlements, and rights are played out and refused. So constructions of unbelonging, for example, to an ethnic group, to a nation, a particular collectivity, a particular country, a particular city, are ways of refusing access to the resources that are given a part of that location, of that position. So when we talk about ethnicity, for example, I don't think it's enough to focus on ethnicity as 
something to do with culture, with the beliefs and practices and traditions of group, but rather to see, as certainly Bach did in some of his work, ethnicity as a boundary marker. Not only a boundary marker only about cultural difference, but a boundary marker that determines who can be included, who can have access. So this is one of the main positions that I've taken into my, in my own work. The other thing I want to say is that differences, because all these categories that we're talking about, these social divisions, relate to differences and inequalities, but differences are, have many different dimensions. And I think it's important to think of differences to do with ethnicity, with gender and with class, as involving particular assumptions in the social space, social ontological assumptions about where they're situated. So um, we can see there that they, as they can be situated as social ontologies, as categories and as social relations, but they are building blocks in whatever way we see them, in those three different ways they're building blocks in the exercise of power. They involve distinctive social relations as well as commonalities and interconnections. What I'm trying to say here is that we can't collapse them into each other. And I think I hold on to that very strongly. And it's a point, for example, that Ori made this afternoon, that it's not possible, they're not, you can't construct complete equivalences between them, although there is a seepage, I think, from one to the other. Um, they are constructions with their own characteristics, with distinctive social relations, but they're also, they also have commonalities and interconnections. There are common principles to them, which I'll say in the next slide. Here on this slide, you'll see that I think as social ontologies, <coughs> the distinctions are found in how they're grounded in different aspects of, of the social. So the ethnic is grounded in social constructions about common stock, about origin, about inalienable culture, and relates to social collectivities. Gender is grounded in sexual difference and its social constructions, although we have to remember that gender can't be seen just as a binary principle. And class, I think, is grounded in the social organization of production, of markets, and related forms of power and domination. So this gives them each a distinctive character, a set of relations as well. On the other hand, there are commonalities between them. And although I don't agree that there's equivalences, I still think they can stand in for each other. For example, Stuart Hall, in a very famous quote, said that, Ethnicity is the modality in which class is lived. So that although that we can think of them as different, very often class is lived through the modalities of ethnicity. And that's very central. So the commonalities between them, I think, are central. And for me, the commonalities is that they all constitute sites of struggle. Sites of struggle in terms of a more powerful and a less powerful powerful side to them. So ethnicity, for example, involves power relations between ethnically dominant groups and subordinate ones. Similarly with gender, we see the, the male patriarchal dominance partner in relation to the subordinate female partner. And similarly with issues of class, where in the tradition of course Marxist conception, we had capital and labor. We can, might want to revise that a little bit, but that principle still stands in terms of domination and in terms of subordination. As well as being sites of struggle around this, um, they're also, they essentialize social relations, we take them for <coughs> granted, they naturalize social relations, they culturalize them, so we assume, for example, that ethnic markers and ethnic boundaries are just about culture, and we treat them as cultural products alone, and they hierarchize social relations. They, they're part of a social stratification system in society. And I believe that a traditional stratification theory fails in as much as it has not been adequately able to look at how gender and ethnicity constitute 
a central part of stratification systems, not just kind of epiphenomena of class, but themselves a part of stratification and hierarchy in society. Their modes for claims, resource claims, involve forms of consciousness and identification and have inclusionary and exclusionary components to them. So that's the commonalities within, between them. So although I thought about holding on to the differences, we have to remember these commonalities played out in different ways, uh, different means, different symbols, different practices, but nonetheless with similar kind of effects in a way in relation to this. And the related notion of belonging, because I started by saying that I thought ideas of belonging were intimately linked to ideas of hierarchy and boundary making. So I want to say a little bit on a tangent here about, about belonging, because one of the things that, that, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the notion of belonging um, recently, and it's su supplanted ideas about identity. Some people, like myself, don't particularly like the term identity because it assumes a possessive individual and a, a, a coherent notion of the self and so on. And some of us have turned to the notion of belonging and there have been distinctions made about belonging and the politics of belonging. I happen to think that actually this distinction um, really undermines the way in which all belonging constructions and claims are politically inflected because they all involve claims and attributions around resources, around representations, about, around forms of different forms of capital. And therefore, when one talks about belonging and struggles about belonging, inevitably <coughs> there is a politics involved. It might be the micro-politics of everyday life, where we might say to our neighbour, um, you know, I'm... Uh, middle class, uh, you know, and, you know, this is me, um, I'm asserting a claim, I'm Ashkenazi, I'm white, um, I'm refusing, disidentifying with more subordinate categories. That is itself a micropolitics. The politics of belonging isn't just about parties and social, bigger social mo mobilizations and connectivities. In our everyday life, we harness these belonging claims in a political way. And for me, they have a number of different dimensions to do with experience, intersubjectivity, organization, and representation, which I'm not going to go into. But I think one of the papers earlier mentions you know, the arenas um, of investigation, three of them, and um, that, I, that I, in some of my work I've presented. Now, one of the ways in which Belonging, and indeed ethnicity, has been understood, is to treat these as very much formulated round shared values, shared culture, shared ways of being. But I think that it's not possible to treat shared values as either a necessary or a sufficient condition for either Ethnic, ethnicity, the dynamics of ethnicity, nor of belonging in its more generic term to encompass other forms of social categorization. Because I think both our sense of belonging to any of these categories, and particularly to ethnicity, is not to do with sharing values, because we might share, a, you know, for example, um, a black migrant in Britain might share the values of Britishness. A black youth, for example, brought up in England, might share the values of, of his or her white neighbour. But those shared values don't yield belonging. It's, shared values are in, inadequate to the task of delivering inclusion and access so that shared values are neither, as I say, necessary or, su or sufficient. You can share values of democratization, for example, but not be included in their club. You might experience racism, as in the case that I gave, example I gave earlier. So they, although they might facilitate belonging, 
And um, I think belonging, um, feeling comfortable, safe, having access, being included, are much more central to it than shared values. And that is an optimistic note, because what it can teach us is that we don't have to be like other people to feel that we can belong, that we can be included. We can belong through modes of solidarity, with, uh, through uh, systems which allow us to be different and yet to be together. Um, so <clears throat> I think taking out the idea of sameness, which shared values flag, helps us to see that sociality does not depend on being the same. Um, but depends on an orientation which allows difference and engages with the other instead of just sharing the same, being the same as the other. And I've already talked about access to resources. And these resources aren't just material resources, um, but they're also resources to do with jobs, with um, education, with um, being respected, um, with avoiding being, not being subjected to racism, um, having citizenship, um, and um, an important aspect is feeling safe, feeling one's not going to be attacked. Um, so that when I talk about resources, I'm not using it in just a strict Marxist sense to, to, to think of economic resources but also the range of other resources that, for example, Boudou has flagged so well in his notions of cultural, and social, cultural, social and symbolic capitals. Now, one of the things that attracted some of us to the idea of belonging, as opposed to identity, is that belonging flags much more the idea of place. Because when we think about belonging, we always think of belonging to something, not just belonging with others. So it references a place. A place, maybe it's a, it's, it could be a symbolic place. It doesn't actually have to be necessarily a territorial um, or physical place, but a set of social relations outside us that we're party to. It, re it involves relationality and within spatial and temporal context. And we've heard already some of these ideas about the importance of space and the importance of temporality. And in my own work, um, I, I like to use the term location because for me, location, um, perhaps more even than place, location references both a place in the physical sense, the location in the physical sense, but also a location in positions of hierarchy, a location in a system of stratification. So a location involves both a place and time, but also a position in the pecking order of things, which has different meaning and resonance, of course, in different times and places. And belonging to something perhaps always involves belonging with, because it, be, it involves belonging with those that might show, share the belonging to. But because the belonging to comes first in notions of belonging, and like identity, which is much more about the self and similar others, it can lead us to looking much more at the ways in which we don't have to other others um, who don't belong to us, to the place. Um, it's because it's not always premised on similarity, but can involve processes of solidarity making, dialogue and engagement. And there are different components that so we need to complexify it. And this is a list, but you could think of many other things perhaps to include in the list, depending on the society that you're living in. 
But one can think, for example, of belonging in terms of formal membership, informal membership, being attached to, claims and attributions, which are political in different ways, um, political mobilizations of different types. Um, so an always located aspect. So complexifying belonging is important. You know, the dyna you know, the dichotomous idea of belonging as something to do with sharing and a sense of safety and belong and polit the politics of belonging as something to do with kind of contestations and mobilizations of belonging needs to be supplemented with a more complex picture of different facets of belonging. Now, how useful is belonging as a heuristic, as a, as a way of, you know, understanding the world and analyzing the world as an analytical prism? It can, ask, it can help us to ask the kinds of questions that perhaps identity has been enabled to, to help us to do. It can ask us, it can help us ask questions about to what um, one belongs to. What are the preconditions of belonging? Um, what are the social relations involved, um, rather than who do people identify with? So the what question becomes much more important in our research. And also broader questions about social inclusion, forms of violence and subordination. Having said that, however, I don't think it's important to say that on its own belonging delivers an analytical prism that avoids essentialism, because belonging too can be understood in essentialist ways. So I think it's important to think of the terms we use as related very much to the kind of framing that we place around our terms, around our concepts. Concepts of their, on their own or words on their own can't do it. So as long as belonging is incorporated into analysis of a concern with social relations of power and the way places and locations are informed by power, it can help us to deliver this. But if belonging is seen as a, in an essentialist way, then it, becomes, it has the same problems as identity. Now that brings me to the question which is at the heart of this conference, if you like, which is about ethnicity. Um, and one of the ways in which both Nira Yuval Davis and my, myself have argued over time in our, both our, the work we've done together in our separate work is that there is a commonality to different categorizations in the construct of ethno, of phenomena to do with ethnos. So that ideas about nation and relations around nation, relations around ethnicity, and relations about race and racialization have various things in common to do with holding on to stock, um, essentializations, boundary making, and so on. They're, they're part of a complex relating, in other words, to boundaries around collectivity. But what's, what is specific about the national, and we know this very much in all the countries that we live in, but perhaps more, most of all in Israel, is that nation is about territorial boundaries, about a political state built on notions of inalienable rights to territory. And it's this claim for a separate political representation for the group, which usually means a separate territorial presence and a separate state that characterizes n national mo mobilizations about the national whether um, particularly ex exclusionary forms of nationalism, I should say, um, the proviso here that there are um, more um, usurpationary forms of nationalism whose, whose concern is not so much to forge a separate state, but rather to counter the states of others. Um, so nationalism here emerges as a form of political mobilization that is a struggle against dominant national categories. And therefore, perhaps from a Marxist um, um, perspective, they might be more acceptable, those forms of usurpationary national 
a nationalism like forms of national liberation struggle, for example, might not be seen as so hegemonic and so um, kind of um, hierarchizing. But there are political dynamics involved in all forms of ethnos phenomena, I would argue. And the other characteristic about nationalism that I see as very important is the link with racism. And there is a, a vast literature on this, on how many nations are formulated around essentialist notions of stock or national character or ethnic character, and how um, the, you know, racial, racism penetrates both into ethnicity and international. And we heard some of the ways this has done so from many of the speakers today, um, particularly in relation to um, the Misrahi and uh, stereo stereotypes and, and characteristics that are attributed to them, which I would say are, are racist, uh, racialized categories. And I would say that the racist tropes, which are so prominent in the world we live in today, have four particular characteristics. Um, well, of course, one can think of more, but I call them the four Ds. And we can see them in terms of danger, of the other being constructed as a danger, the collectivized other, as a threat, and as a security issue. We can see them this in terms of deviance, of the other as endemically deviant and evil. Um, they cannot be accommodated by hegemonic culture or interests as a deficit, as deficient and unable to meet the level required by society, and in terms of disgust, which is with its sister desire, which some have argued is very important, particularly in the literature in Britain by people like Stuart Hall um, about the relationship of, in, of, of, of color, in, with color racism. Um, so the other's way of life gives rise to emotions, to affect which have physical and bodily responses, leading to avoidance, sexualization, and animality. Disgust involves ideas of contagion and contamination. And we can see this you know, in, in most um, racialized social relations, this aspect of it. Sometimes one is more prominent than the other, but nonetheless, they all cohere together to form a very a, a very strong form of violence against the other. Now, which brings me really to, I suppose, the heart of some of my work, which is to do with intersectionality. Because what I've been talking about is about social categories of different, how they're linked to boundaries and hierarchies, the different forms that ethnicity takes, that the fact they're all resource case. But how do they link together if, if in concrete social relations? And as we've seen with the concern with ethnicity and class here, you know, we need to look at them in tandem. What, what do we do? How do we do it? And this is a big, the $60 billion question, and I'm afraid I haven't got the answer for you, how we should do it, because it's still work in progress for many of us. But I just wanted to start here with gender, partly because I knew before I came, that probably, as with many conferences on ethnicity, gender would be an underexplored issue. So I wanted to flag the idea of the nation and gender. And here, building particularly on the work that I've done with Nira Yubar Davis, you know, our primary work, which you know, has kind of led, as well as the work of others, to a growth in the area of interest of nation and gender, we can see how gender categories infiltrate notions of the nation and how women and indeed men are used differently by the nation, how the categories and social relations of gender are intricately woven with both class and national ascriptions and struggles. So I'm just going to just leave that there for a moment. I'm not going to talk about it, just as a reminder of how, you know, we can't talk about nation and ethnicity, really, without also talking about some of the characteristics that gender can impart to it. Okay, shall I move on? Okay. 
So I now want to turn to an intellect the intersectional lens and my own understanding of it, because one of the first things I want to say about intersectionality is that it is a heterogeneous field. And there is as much disagreement um, amongst those who, use, who, say, who claim they use an intersectional lens as an agreement. And indeed, the history is itself fraught with claims and counterclaims of origins. And um, I read a piece um, quite recently saying that um, white women who use the term are trying to um, colonize the work of black women um, and that we should always acknowledge um, the, you know, the, the debate, the anti-racism debate um, and the subordination of black women, particularly in the United States, when delivering it, the problems of translation of the category to newer con context. Um, it's a traveling theory and gets distorted in, in travel and translations. But I, my belief is that an intersectional lens is a kind of, again, a heuristic, an aid memoir. It's reminding us about the complexity, about the multiplicity, and about the simultaneity of social relations. And indeed, one could say that intersectionality, from that point of view, is actually good social theory. But you might, this is my point of view. And indeed, many of the best social theories recognize complexity, although, of course, for historical reasons and patriarchal re reasons, I issues of gender particularly weren't incorporated in the work. Um, and looking at the interconnections between different forms of categorization and hierarchy require different levels of analysis. And I think we should be clear about the levels of analysis that we use. If we're interested in categories, that leads us in one direction. If we're looking at concrete relations, things on the ground, when we study cleaners, when we study uh, soldiers, uh, you know, when we, when we study um, kind of um, workers, you know, we're, talking, we're looking at concrete social relations. And to me, it's important to think of the categories as emergent rather than as pre-given. The categories come to us through our research. We find them. We don't impose them upon our research field. And I think that's very important. The other thing is when we're looking at the connections between ethnicity, gender, and class, and other kinds of social divisions, they're not added. They can't be added onto each other. And this, was, this is um, something that's been taken up recently, something that we already said with Nero in 1983. I don't want to uh, ring my own um, bell. But, you know, the idea that it's non additive that it's um, complex, they're shaped by the other, by each other in context of power. And their salience varies. I don't think in every research you need to always find gender as salient. In some cases, it's more salient than others. In some cases, ethnicity is what's important, particularly in, you know, when there is very dominant ethnic conflict. And perhaps in a society like Israel, if I may, you know, perhaps the concern with ethnicity and nation makes sense because this is where you know, the conflict and contestation are taking place. That doesn't mean, of course, that feminism is marginal and the struggles of women are marginal, but in public debate, often, it's about ethnicity, or perhaps the silence, I should say, of ethnicity. But having said that about intersectionality, we have to recognise some of the difficulties and problems it has. And this is a critical note, and it's through this critical note that I've tried to rethink it using some different terms. Um, and there have been various criticisms. Some people say um, that it's uh, an umbrella term, a rhetorical device. It's, it's just, you know, you just say you intersectionality and you're doing your job, that's enough. You know, it's like a mantra. You, know, you don't actually have to do anything. You just say, I'm doing intersectionality. Um, it's a consensus signifying term. So we're all feminists, we all do intersectional work. 
Some have said it flattens difference. It makes them equivalent. It treats class, race, gender, as though they're the same, they have the same effectivities. Um, some say that it ignores capitalism, uh, and the theorizes power, uh, is, is vague, um, identitarian, focusing too much on identities. For others, it's the fact that it's so heterogeneous and made it's a good thing because it allows creativity. I'm not sure whether I, I buy that one myself. But you know that there are liberal appropriations of intersectionality. It's used uh, by social policy makers now, you know, in a watered down ver version, you know. And of course, that um, as there's coloniality, you know, um, what about the kinds of theoretical work that has been done in the global south? which some writers have argued has always been intersectional, you know, and that's been ignored. It indicates the dominance of Eurocentric, Westocentric, and I would say particular, particularly American Americanocentric um, theory. Uh, you know, these are the citations, these are the names we hear. Equally important work coming from other countries, uh, other groups, gets ignored and isn't published, perhaps when published isn't cited. Now, having said that, um, I wanted to just suggest some ways in which we can avoid um, um, some of the problems. One of the distinct, distinctive problems of intersectionality is found in the word. The word itself, intersection. What are the sections? You see, um, are there three of them? Are there ten of them? What are they? How do we characterise them? And I think that may be a trivial thing, but it's important because sections already assumes that there are given entities. There are given groups, for example, or given categories. And what we're looking at is how they connect these given categories or given groups connected one with, one with each other. And I think that constitutes one of the singular problems, the focus on categories, the focus on how does race connect with ethnicity. We try to do it in, in discussions, how do we connect ethnicity and class, categories, and we find it very difficult, actually. You know, how do you, how do, you do that work? When is it ethnicity? When is it class? How do we know whether it's ethnicity at play here or class at play here? Because when we ask those questions, we're assuming they're given entities that then we can investigate how they each connect with one another. The reality is they're not given entities. They're emergent, and they're emergent in social relations. They're part of processes as outcomes. We can treat them as outcomes but not as things to begin our investigation with. And I think that might be a bit of a, um, you know, sort of, what's the word? Her her um, her not heritage, a heretic, a heretic to say that. But nonetheless, I think starting with process, starting with relations, starting with outcomes, rather than identities, categories or groupings, is a very important way into our research on these issues because then our categories become emergent and the social relations become more manifest. Um, so we need to also pay attention to the multiplicity of different arenas, and already we've heard something about that, within which they're played out. And in my own work, I've talked about the organizational structural, the representational discursive, the intersubjective, interactional, and the experiential meaning making societal arenas of power. And also, at transcalar levels, I've heard discussions about place, but where is place? You know, how big, how small is place? And there are different understandings of place here. We can have the largest, which is perhaps the universe, the world, the transnational, and of course the national the local, of course. So transcalar analysis is important. For example, if we think of social stratification, or indeed just ethnicity, we can look at it both in terms of how it um, occurs 
relations within neighborhoods, relations within cities, relations within nations, how it might, they, these things manifest themselves at transnational levels, where ethnicity, for example, might become diasporic, um, with different emphasis, where stratification might become complex, because transnational actors may occupy different class positions, and positions, ethnic positions in the hierarchy of ethnicity, in different countries. In their homeland, for example, um, Ghanaian migrant, migrants, when they return home, may occupy um, a good position um, in the hierarchy, but when they're in Britain or when they're in um, Israel or, or Sweden, they're very low down on the scale. So that it complicates our understanding of social stratification when we look at the transscalar elements. Um, and as well as looking at processes um, and outcomes rather than identities um, and categories, I would like also a focus on social occasions. Um, and I've already mentioned I prefer the notion of location to the notion of place. Um, because the term for me of location, particularly social location, um, involves both a sense of place, as I said, and a position within relations of difference and hierarchy. And translocations are, occur when subjects are embedded in shifting and contradictory locations. Because we can't assume that these locations that sh subjects shift from, from one country to another, from one context to another, from one time to another, um, are just are, are kind of um, kind of homogenous, or or that they're um, you know that they're in accord with one another. They can be quite contradictory. For example, men may hold positions of power in one context but may be very subordinated in the workplace, for example, if they're workers. So that here the term translocation signifies the importance of looking at contradictory social positions. And, and I would argue and that contradictory social posi positions are, in a way, enabling for human subjects to occupy those positions. And as a migrant myself, um, whose parents went to England when I was very small, and who went, who came from a, what we call an intellectual family, but went to a working class school because my father was a communist and very poor, I, fe I felt, and maybe wrongly, and perhaps this is, this is more intuitive than evidential, that somehow having occupied these contradictory positions has yielded a, a potential for um, kind of understanding of, for knowledge making and for the uh, contestational and, you know, more um, open ways of thinking. And in a way, I mean, Karl Mannheim, of course, talked very much about the intellectuals as being non-class subjects and as non-class subjects they were able to give a kind of better kind of truth a relational truth and although i think he was quite wrong to think of intellectuals as not having class positions nonetheless the kernel of this is about the importance of movement from place from position to other positions and how this might possibly not always open up our understanding. I'm thinking particularly not always because we know that, for example, in relation to Brexit and the kind of nationalism that it kind of was manifested and indeed generated, that many people who had moved across positions, like migrants, supported Brexit. I was astonished, I suppose um, upset rather than astonished, perhaps not surprised so much as um, upset, that some migrants actually um, felt that European, some, some Asian migrants, for example, and indeed um, Afro-Caribbean migrants, some of them voted for Brexit because they didn't want open borders. They didn't want um, Euro Eastern Europeans coming in. The countries 
got too many people anyway, some of them said. Why do we need more? So movement, uh, this is a sort of just a, a little bit on the side to say that movement doesn't necessarily yield greater understanding, but I think it opens up the potential for understanding. And uh, tied to the idea of translocation, I've, I've always used, preferred the term positionality to the term identity. Positionality for me is important because although a lot of my work um, has stressed the importance of structures of power and institutional arrangements, nonetheless, it's important to recognize that individuals take up positions. And it's through the taking up of these positions that the social order gets reproduced and transformed. They're an essential element. And so the positionalities of people, the positions they take at different points in time, um, which may partly be linked to objective positions, but may also be linked to forms of understanding, to values, um, to engagements in social life, um, it's not just about structural position, as we know. For example, we know that you know, the, the Marxist idea that the working class will develop a consciousness and revolutionary, we have found, although it's a very crude example of giving, this doesn't work. Some working class people are highly conservative and nationalistic. So positionality relates to position, objective position, but ta the taking up of positions. And these positions may be taken up differently in different contexts for different strategies, for different reasons. And they're taken up also in relation to others, both what well, might be constructed as similar others, but also different others. So the idea of translocational positionality points our attention to a kind of intersectional work that crosses the boundary between structure and agency, focuses on processes and outcomes, but inserts individuals, not as possessive individuals, as the philosopher might say, but as individuals that are emplaced and located in positions of hierarchy, and how their positionalities emerge, if you like, partly as strategies within those um, locations. So I'm coming towards the end, you might, um, like to know of my presentation, which is just a reflection, having said that, having, having argued through um, some of the issues that I think are central to the work that you're doing, to move to a kind of, to, in my title I had to theory and practice. Unfortunately, the practice is very small um, that I'm able to present you with, but it's a reflection um, about moving beyond the violence of borders and boundaries. Because although borders and boundaries are part of everyday life, and perhaps all, have always been, historically, part of everyday life in different ways, and perhaps they're being strengthened today in ways we never imagined possible in the past, through the role that individuals are taking in policing others, um, I think that we need to move beyond them. We need to move beyond them as fixed elements of the social landscape, to cross borders, to refuse borders, to undermine borders, in as much as we can, in as much as our social our society can let us, because I know in some societies it's more constrained than others. And I think a translocational, intersectional lens refuses fixed and inalienable differences and rights, fixed borders and boundaries. It opens up the borders and the boundaries, spilling over from one to the other. <clears throat> Flags intersections of differences and commonalities. It says, hey, we shouldn't just focus on our differences. Look at our commonalities, not as just in terms of the fact we're all human beings, but the commonalities of our position as workers, as women, and the differences, of course, that this place, not just as ethnic subjects, the differences as ethnic subjects, 
transcends essentializations points to the potential of solidarity. And I think solidarity is a very central term here because solidarity recognises the possibility of engaging without similarity, without necessarily agreement. So solidarity can be forged in relation to difference. Solidarity for particular struggles, just for justice, for example, across and between difference, and the importance of transformative dialogue as far as is possible. But, but we know the lessons that we've learned are very, make us quite pessimistic about the potential of dialogue, actually. Because um, I come from a society, um, Cyprus originally, um, that is locked in a, you know, a division which manifests itself as a division between ethnicities, involves uh, a, col a coloniality and um, oppression um, of different types. Um, dialogue is taking place um, amongst groups, peace, um, peace initiatives, dialogue between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots has been taking place for at least 20 years now. But this dialogue, unfortunately, has not been able to deliver a solution to the Cyprus problem, or indeed essentially undermine some of the more nationalistic elements in the society, and certainly has not infiltrated strongly enough, I believe, into the political system and the role of political parties. So although we might think of dialogue as a means, and we always say, we need dialogue, we need a conversation, because without a conversation and dialogue, nothing becomes possible. But dialogue on its own is not enough. Not only do we have to have an equal place from which to speak, as Habermas reminded us, but we also need other things to be in place, particularly, I think, political will, in order for effective dialogue to pay, take place and the dismantling of the fixed borders and boundaries which are so violent in the societies we live in today. Thank you very much. The discussant will be Professor Oli Benjamin. Oli is an associate professor of the Sociology and Anthropology Department and at the Gender Studies program at bar -Ilan University. She is the author of two books, Feminism, Family and Identity in Israel, Women's Marital Status, which was published in 2011 with Michal Rom. It introduces a theory on couples negotiation and the power relations between feminism and feminism in Israel. Her second book that came out in 2016, Gendering Israel's Outsourcing, the Erasure of Employees' Caring Skills, introduces a feminist perspective on public procu procurement okay, in welfare, education, and healthcare services and elaborates her perspective on precarious employment as a feminist issue. She is currently involved in studies on public procurement as a policy kit and the managerialization of the welfare ministry, on emotions, particularly resentment and intersectionality, on economic violence, on mothers and daughters' relations in the context of poverty, and on sexual subjectivity. She chairs the Ministry of Education Committee for updating the sociology curriculum for Israel High School, and she's an activist at the Coalition for Direct and Fair Employment. So that will be. Thank you, Ona, for such a kind introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been sitting here all day, not telling any epic jokes. Ethnicity <laughs> is a huge uh, engine of jokes in Israel. <laughs> so I was very careful to find a joke for you that, uh, you know, I was really walking on, on what do you call it, eggshells or whatever, and I'm going to tell you that joke first before we go into the serious stuff, right? So a guy comes to his mom and says, uh, Mom, I'm, I'm getting married. And she's a joke. Mom says, never mind, my darling, I really love you. Everything is going to be fine. So the guy says, eh, but they want to come and eh, get to know you and they will stay with us over the weekend. And how do you think we should go about their sleeping arrangement? And the mom says, well, you and your girlfriend will sleep in your bedroom and the parents can have 
Hey, uh, man, your dad stay in uh, bedroom, and uh, my, your dad will sleep in the living room. And when are you going? Where are you going to sleep, mom? So she says, hopefully by Friday I I will be there. <laughs> I didn't tell you that she was Polish, I'm sorry. Listen, told me that I should emphasize that and I forgot. She's a Polish man and Polish woman is the utmost Ashkenazi man, right? So it's better to die than to have an Ethiopian <laughs> And it, this is a joke, but really you know how jokes are, yeah? So um, so we had we have a tick on eth ethnic jokes. Thank you so much, Professor Antius, for a fascinating and useful conceptualization of belonging and its negotiation during times of enhanced exclusions, both structural and interpersonal. I believe that your input is an immensely important alternative to the emerging notion of superdiversity, which is far less pro process focused. I see your argument as an opportunity to correct the analysis of ethnicity from a feminist intersectionality perspective. And in my short discussion here, I intend to highlight this contribution. As a researcher of the welfare state, and particularly the attack of neoliberal economic globalization on the welfare state, questions of belonging are salient to me particularly the understanding of multiple directions of analysis. Belonging is focused on structures in the sense of examining broader economic and political institutional frameworks. And at the same time, belonging is focused on processes, broader social relations in all their complexity, including discourses and representations. In the Israeli context, the focus on belonging becomes a powerful and analytical indicator on where our diverse communities are, attempting to emphasize belonging, hoping for a better citizenship contract, and dealing with the state denial of such belonging and entitlements. The empirical investigation of disappearing entitlements is crucial for studying the meaning of intersectionality. In my own research, I recently analyzed interview material which I collected for mothers providing for their children in poverty, to find just how different are the frustrations experienced by different ethno-national categories in their encounters with welfare authorities, and how these differences actually require a process-focused perspective on the becoming of the entitled citizen, precisely the perspective you have kindly presented here. Since the interviews focused on the experience of poverty, identity issues disappeared completely. Instead, the notion of belonging and non-belonging emerged as powerful. When Jewish mothers who provide in poverty failed to convince the authorities of their eligibility to one form of support or another, them and their children are left ashamed of not being able to participate on an equal level in their school, families, and communities' activities. When Bedouin, Druze, or Muslim mothers fail to convince the authorities of their eligibility, they might find themselves in situations of homelessness and hunger. Thus, as citizens, they belong to the collective, but the authorities gradually empty this belonging of its implication as responsibility. I'd like to illustrate the strength of the focus on belonging by a recent incident reported in the newspapers. It is the story of Fadi Maluk, a 23-year-old son of a Palestinian collaborator with the Israeli security forces, whose father was given Israeli citizenship and a very small public housing in Jaffa when Fadi Maluk was a young child. The very small flat in which 13 adults and children lived together in intense conditions of conflicts, rows, shouting, and violence became a death trap. Fadi Malak murdered his two sisters two weeks ago. 
resembling members of quite a few ethno-national categories in this country, the formal citizenship allegedly implying belonging does not include state responsibility. Many welfare reports were written about the family. Many legal statements described the danger Fadi Maluk was for the 19-year-old Nurit Maluk and 21-year-old Khait Maluk, his sisters, both mothers of young babies, took for themselves common names among the Jewish majority, but no state authority translated the knowledge and deep familiarity with the impossible conditions in which the murdered sisters live as an indication that they need another place to live in. The fact they needed, they needed urgent protection was known for years, but didn't become a practical action. My discussion of your argument, Professor Antis, begins with the heavy weight put on the murdered sisters' shoulders by, the, by their Palestinian belonging, or should I say non-belonging, given their father's collaboration biography. Both engaged in typical single mother's daily struggle for economic survival, exposed to continuous violence of men within their families and men outside their families. They illustrate your emphasis on belonging as a negotiable process. Their gender, class, ethno-national citizenship, translocational positionality was concurrently complex and simple. Complex in that we cannot tell whether they could identify with any community and which were the values they embraced. Simple because the harsh lack of resources left no escape path for them. Reflecting your understanding of intersectionality, their identity and belonging were a set of struggling processes and not their possessive characteristics. Their structural position was indeed a part of a process relating to boundary making and hierarchy in social life and the form it took in the social and cultural space in which they lived practically emerged from the impossibility of their life conditions. But let me emphasize the contribution of this theoretical framing more systematically by comparing it to other notions of intersectionality. Today, six types of approach to how to go about the interrelations of gender, class, ethnicity can be identified. First, uh, there is the type of, that is a little bit partial, as the single approach where all inequalities are at least partly reduced to a single overarching inequality, such as class or social exclusion. Although long rejected in feminist theory, it is important not to ignore this reduction to one explanatory inequality or set of uh, social relations, since such approach can still be found in theory and in practice. In the sister's murder story, which I just told you. The temptation to reduce the understanding of the inequality to such social exclusion is powerful. However, following that line doesn't leave much space for interpersonal differences and for the possibility that some NGOs may have been working in a similar neighborhood, replacing the, the government in supporting other women in similar positions. Secondly, an asymmetric type of approach where one inequality is dominant, but others are not totally ignored. Rather, they are treated as secondary. Again, the story begs for this mentioning of the ethno-national religious background and the gender as possibly important, but clearly not as important as the social exclusion enacted through extreme poverty. Thirdly, parallel, where multiple inequalities are treated as separate and distinct, addressed by different policies, laws, and agencies, while rarely recommended by gender theory, this approach has a substantial history in policy practice. In the murder story, this may well be the case as the social policy of no public housing for Palestinian single mothers, as shown recently by Tal Menner, could be probably analyzed as separate from the gender-based code of honor 
and the historical neglect of the drug problem among youth in Jaffa. Fourthly, treating gender, class, ethnicity in an additive way where groups that suffer multiple inequalities are specifically addressed as doubly disadvantaged, where disadvantages are considered to be community, while this is a common form of speech, the murdered single mothers were triply disadvantaged. But this cannot take us long way as the emphasis on their structure, structural exclusion erases their own efforts and struggles to use all possible resources in their situation. Now we come to the fifth way for taking multiple uh, in inequalities into account, which is the most prevalent form of treating such multiplicity following Hancock's work, the mutual constitution the mutual constitution thesis, where groups at intersections are seen as uniquely constructed categories of mutually constitutive inequalities. However, if we we'll stay with this form of mutual constitution, we are bound to overemphasize identity with little option to take into account structural exclusions which are far from constituted by either subjective experiences or objective barriers encountered on the individual level. Sixthly, the mutual shaping of inequalities, which suggests that while the effects of one inequality on other inequalities may be discerned, the separate systems of inequality remain. And indeed, Antje's argument allows us the advantages of the sixth approach, looking at the way inequalities operate, each on their own and each shaping each other, staying with the individual level negotiation while focusing on the reproduction of hierarchies and power relations. In other words, we see that Andre's argument is an opportunity to maintain the complexity of intersectional inequalities while understanding exactly how to go about examining the processes in which each inequality both stays separate in its own strength and shapes, shapes the other. As a result of such clear empirical project, we can begin develop and demand a social policy focused feminism, one that highlights oppressive mechanisms and structures next to interpersonal processes and encounters where opportunities are sometimes extended. However, what makes the feminist perspective, which was presented here, very close to Patricia Hill Collins' understanding of intersectionality as a, as a political agenda, rather than just a theoretical framework or analytical toolkit, is Antje's emphasis on solidarity. And it's here where we see the strength of an action feminism as opposed to scholarly feminism in creating optimism even up under the toughest conditions. Let me repeat Ante's call for constructing solidarity across differences, across class and gender cons concerns, because solidarity is the only measure by which common future can be built, irrespective of differences in beliefs or ways of life, solidarity and not diversity is the feminist path we should insist on taking. Going back to the Malloc family and the orphan babies whose faith, I'm afraid, is not going to be shaped by any gestures of solidarity. I'd like to raise the question for one question for future analysis. When we used to speak of specific inequalities and oppressions, including the murder of women within their family and mother struggles against po poverty, were we not in a better position to unveil specific politics by which the state supports women's exclusion and oppression, as well as violence against women? Have the complex, multi-directional argument on outcomes and process uh, not taken us away from clear information about specific power structures? Let's hope that research methodologies will allow us to do both, trace the multiple level negotiation 
and hierarchies, as well as gain continuously better understanding of how the institutional power practices operate against us. Thank you, Orly. Um, I would like to invite Floria and Orly maybe to answer some questions. We have time, and I'm sure people have many questions. Both talked about it, and both 
story is a way to be with different, not similarity. But uh, in your case, you talked about, for example, sense of security, sense of safety, which is uh, crucial. <coughs> but sense of security and sense of safety requires some type of similarity or imagined similarity. It's a empirical lesson, because you walk the street and you, you want to imagine some form of uh, some form of uh, shared normative behavior regarding violence, uh, maybe physical or uh, verbal violence, and, uh, and a lot of studies and uh, the sense of safety is resting on a sense of some form of similarity. So I think this. So I, I'm asking. How can you can you face this challenge that, simila that you need some form of similarity? I think, or if you think you need some form of similarity to reach some sense of shared safety in space, physical space, in diverse space, or even to reach solidarity. <laughs> 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 That's a negotiation. But I'll let you answer after. In order to answer your question, your good question, I'd like to use Neil's idea of a temporal perspective into ethnicity. And I'd like to say that relationship and inter-ethnic relationship are built over time and in the lo in a long a in over long periods of times. And we know that we have this gradual a changing notions of who is similar to us and who is different from us. And over time, people get, when people live together, let's say in the same region, same areas, the same technology, using the same technologies, they're communicating on Facebook perhaps, they experience themselves as more similar to each other. Well, perhaps to begin with, it, that it wasn't like that. So I think that a lot of uh, what we say when we speak of solidarity is a, pro a longitudinal process, a long-term process, where people can come together and dialogue and hear each other and th build together an image of each other that is trustworthy. That is, I can trust you even if, you're, if I still see you different, <coughs> as different, and gradually, on the basis of trust, I will see you as more similar. So I think... Uh, you're right that we need the, uh, the issue to experience ourselves as similar, but similarity doesn't stand in one place. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, and I agree with that. Um, you know, I would, I would like to suggest that when people think about similar safety as a product of similarity, um, they think of similarity in a particular way. They think of it usually similarity in terms of cultural value, ethnic, ethnic similarity. But when we think of similarities amongst people and take an intersectional perspective and recognize gender, class, age, political values, not just ethnic values, um, forms of association, ideas about rights, um, and so on, once we broaden the notion of similarity, we can see that that kind of scarecrow we need to be similar in order to live together kind of disappears because we recognize the differences is actually everywhere. And that, you know, this concern with similarity along ethnic lines often kind of demonizes a particular kind of difference while accepting and naturalizing other kinds of difference, We're not even noticing them. Um, so that I think what you're getting at is there have to be certain preconditions for living in safety and security. Um, we live in a risk society anywhere, modern societies are risk societies. But we need a modicum at least of ontological security in order to feel we belong, as well of course inclusion, access to resources and so, and so on. So I think we need organisational principles and um, forms of legislation and social um, kind of um, structures which allow for this to happen. In other words, do not produce 
difference as antithetical to commonality. And it's only because in our societies we think of the ethnic other as a danger to the, through a racialized notion and through a politicization of ethnicity that we, we come to perhaps even think about these questions. How can we live together in difference? I mean, we live in multicultural cities. You know, European cities are profoundly multicultural. People have very different ways of understanding and thinking. And yet, you know, people go about their everyday life. There's everyday multiculturalism and conviviality, as Paul Gilroy calls it. So difference is not an impediment to feelings of security. You can feel, you know, more secure, um, you know, walking in Lewisham, in, in near where I live, which is highly multicultural, than, you know, living uh, perhaps, you know, sort of being in, in a white um, sort of ghetto, um, you know, where there might be crime, burglary, other kinds of things taking place. You know, what happens, criminality, which is what you're talking about, is not something that's produced by ethnic difference. It might be over-determined onto ethnic difference, mm -hmm. but that's another story. More questions? Um, my question relates to solidarity as well. Because I, I enjoyed the talk tremendously and I followed you uh, for most of it as long as you discussed how we should conduct uh, conceptualization in terms of, of uh, dislocational analysis, intersectional analysis. But when it comes to solidarity, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on how this kind of analysis can be, in and for itself, performative, and what mechanism turns this kind of analysis to performative in, in, in you know, changing the society that tries to analyze? I mean, I, just, I have to say that um, you know, this is a kind of end opinion piece. And I think your question is extremely important, and that's a question that we need to ask. So, although I embrace the potential of a notion of solidarity, I acknowledge that the mechanisms by which we can deliver it are very underdeveloped mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. present societies. And it was you're, what you're asking me for is for a kind of political, in a way, or possibly for a political programmatic, which I don't have with this. Um, you know what? What do we do to get there? Um, I think we we kind of battle away at in my you know in, from my position as an academic and a theorist, um, and theorist the worker by challenging received <coughs> concepts, by opening up possibilities, by by asking questions, by rejecting essentialism and naturalizations, by critical thinking, if you like, as as you know the. Um, critical theory aims to do. Um, but, you know, the idea at the end was really a kind of hopeful kind of prescription rather than a thought out um, politics. Thank you, though, for asking that question. Yes. I just, I just wanted to illustrate what you just said with a small example of things that happen in Israel now. One of the struggles that goes now in Israel is about the refugees, the Sudanese and Eritrean refugees. And one of the slogans of people who were in support of the refugees was to raise the, the slogan, we are all refugees. And this comes in contradistinction to those who try to show difference. Right. So, I mean, similarities are produced usually in the struggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Danny. I want to actually follow up. I think this is a very good example, and I want to follow up on it and ask another question. Um, to ask, not politically, but on the analytical aspect of it, I mean, I, I like very much the way you. Danny, can you stand up? I yeah. I like, yeah, I'm also tired, so it's a way to kind of be more. <laughs> I like very much the way you use, you propose to use belonging and how belonging is much more open than identity. And I'm all for using solidarity, because that's what I also do in my work. But still, I think 
the, the way you assume that solidarity in any way is more inclusive than identity is, I think, problematic because solidarity is always about inclusion as much as it is about exclusion, as much. And every political struggle is always about an idea, so if you are not for that idea, you're excluded from that political struggle. Mm -hmm. There is no way that a nation, is, by my understanding, is more, is more exclusive than a political struggle. And a nation always began as a political struggle. Mm -hmm. And there are processes in the political struggle, some, I mean, it depends how large the nation, but uh, well, this nation for sure, but many nations. I think the idea of a national movement, let's say a national movement is like other movements with its own baggage, of course, and own problems, but in the, more, in the analytic, analytical sense of it, any political struggle has its inclusion and exclusion. And in that sense, I don't think I, w w I understand why in the context of transnational context or even in a broader sense, intersectionality, of course, solidarity is much more useful than identity. Um, and that's also what I'm trying to do. But I think we need to remember that it's always about exclusion as much as it is about inclusion. It's all only about looking at, I mean, sometimes we forget that ideology is very exclusionary. So if you look at feminist movements or other movements, and of course, national movement is a very good example of that, um, there's always those dynamics. So in that sense, I'm not sure that solidarity is, again, it's much more useful than identity, but I'm not sure that it's much more uh, <coughs> inclusive in, you know, in general. Of course, every context has its own context for that. <laughs> I think you missed the main point. The main point is that exclusion, exclusionary mechanisms are processual, are interactional. They happen in history. They're, I mean, no exclusion is essential. These things are socially and culturally and historically and economically created. And so if we increase our awareness to how, how they were created, all exclusions can be deconstructed, I mean, not very quickly perhaps, but uh, with more people engaged in the project of di dissolving them or criticizing them, then the exclusion can become less dominant and we can marginalize it. So I think it's with, uh, what uh, Fluantas is saying is not anything about, yes, let's come to a world that is exclusion free, this is, of course, out, outside of a very, very realistic uh, way of looking at the real world. What she's saying to us is, let's, let's see that we, we are part of a historical process and we should emphasize <coughs> its strength in dissolving exclusionary mechanisms. Oh, thank you, Wally, uh, for that. <laughs> um, I, 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 want, I want to say that um, when we talk about exclusions, we're actually possibly talking about many different things and many different mechanisms and many very different types. As an example, a debate about do you let a fascist into the classroom mm -hmm. to talk to your students? Um, what about free speech? We don't want to exclude. But sometimes you have to make a decision. We need to exclude in order to preserve our politics of inclusion. Sometimes exclusion is less true. Similarly with solidarity politics. Solidarity amongst workers in different countries. Solidarity across ethnic groups with migrant group um, organizations joining worker parties. Across, um, across um, uh, yes, um, the uh, trade unions and gay rights <coughs> coming together to force solidarity around specific struggles, about specific goals. These are central, they are central elements um, and very powerful. And as you, um, Abby has said, you know, those similarities of form, these struggles, similarities of values um, already mean, don't mean identity policies. They don't mean similarity of culture or even similarity of ways of life, but they mean some kind of common conception of the aim, of the goal. And this is where solidarity is so important, when people from different kind of so-called identities and ethnicities can come together to pursue common humanitarian goals. And in the process, of course, sometimes some people have to be left out 
because those people don't share those goals. So of course, in any political mobilisation, sol solidarity, even identity parties, there have to be boundaries of who participates because some people might want to come in and destroy the goals. Um, you can't avoid those sorts of bounds, but there's a very different notion to a notion of a world without ethnic and cultural othering and discrimination, which is the kind of thing that I was talking about. Um, what? Just extending your last point, uh, I'm an immigration scholar. Would you advocate uh, the world without borders, like open borders and free movement of people? <coughs> is it tenable? Is it utopian? How does it, you know, come together with your theorizing? Yeah, you're, ask, you're asking me a position about my politics, yeah. and my politics yeah. is to support the world without borders. <laughs> yes. And of course, you know, that there are difficulties in implementing it, but I don't think they're the kind of difficulties and fears that many people put forward. So this is the utopia we should aim for? We could aim for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, should. I, I, would, I would like a world without borders, yes. Okay. Without that That's that what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More question? None? I want to thank you again. Both